Hi, this is Julie Martinez Hayes. I'll be talking about Chapter 2 of Security Fundamentals textbook for CTI 120 uh, for Wake Tech. Just to let you know, I will be trying to do a condensed version of this chapter, even though it's extremely uh, beefy and in fact it kind of condenses an entire course into one chapter, which is difficult to do. My usual contact information, don't forget to look for me on Teams. If you don't see me on Teams, uh, email me and try to reach me by email. The agenda for today is to cover most of the chapter that we can, but focusing on authentication, especially Active Directory and Windows servers, and what are rights versus, versus permissions. We will be covering NTFS versus Share, because that's a big deal. And Monday, you'll be trying to take the quiz on this, so you need to have read the book at least once before even seeing this lecture. Also, that quiz will be visible after you complete your homework questions and the lab. Uh, this whole chapter is NOS 130 in a nutshell. It is Windows Client with a little bit of Windows Server. Uh, the, the biggest element of security is very simple and low budget, and that is permissions on fi folders and files. What user has access to what? And that needs to be set up from the get-go, from the start of an organization, to see who, who really has access. And that's where security starts. The AAA you've already covered, which is authentication, authorization, and accounting. We'll go into a little bit more detail about how authentication works for Windows. This is this focuses on Windows more in particular because the vast majority of domains are Windows Server. Authentication is proving who you are and there are several ways to do that. Authentication is something you know, like a password. It could be a PIN, but with Windows uh, there's also a picture password where you can do swipes and circles or gestures in front of a camera. So there are combinations of ways that, that you can prove you know who you are. Um, there are also the secret questions and and other ways. So it's something you know and something you have. The something you have is usually a, a certificate, digital certificate, but it can be a physical thing like a key fob. Um, the RSA key fob is one of the smartest and earliest in the industry for having secondary and encrypted information to help you get logged on. This uh, little device on the screen would provide a pin that only works with the software that it's nearby. It has to be near, physically near the laptop that has the software installed. It provides a pin based on a certificate back at the office. It also only provides that particular pin for a matter of seconds and only to that particular user uh, and is encrypted. Nice stuff to have. Uh, a cheaper way to do that is to have a pin, a six digit or eight digit pin sent to a cell phone. So that would also be considered dual factor authentication. You put in a password plus you're going to get a code on your phone and if that code on the phone isn't done then you haven't logged in and it won't, should not let you in. Okay, it can be also, it doesn't have to be to a cell phone, it can be to a secondary email account, but again, if someone has your device or has your accounts, that could be compromised. Biometrics is something we are, it's not so much something we have, but you know, we do have fingerprints, um, but something we are is, is unique to us, it should be unique to us, fingerprints are one. Um, Usually I have the students list all this from to me in class. Uh, there are ocular scans. There are a number of body parts that are unique. Ears are unique to us. Um, facial recognition you might have used on a cell phone, but that is horribly inaccurate. You might find that if you put glasses on, it doesn't work. Or if someone that looks kind of like you, a sister or brother looks like you, it, it'll let them in. Um, so most folks say that biometrics are tough to cheat, but in my experience there's so many both false positives and false negatives. Um, false positives being that someone got access who should not have, and false negatives means you are the right person and it decided you weren't and, and denied you access. 
So those are the things that biometrics come with along with a big price. Biometric reading hardware along with the software along with the IT person's maintenance of the system is extremely expensive and quite frankly not worth it from what I have seen personally. Uh, but it is more and more popular and hopefully it'll get more accurate. Two other systems of security are keywords in this chapter, RADIUS and TACX. RADIUS is a Microsoft product, it's a Microsoft server product, and what it is is it's a server in the, uh, the DMZ area that filters incoming connections from outside the network. So I might be working from home and trying to get in, and it'll say, well, who are you? Why do you want to get in? Let me see what VPN access you have. You know, it might say you're not from the appropriate computer to remote in. You're from some odd computer that we don't recognize. Therefore, we're not going to let you in. It also could decide that I have access, but it doesn't like my virus protection software because it hasn't been updated in a while, and it can deny me access to some tools but not others. So I might be able to get things that are in the DMZ anyway, like my email server or my OneDrive, and not access to anything behind that second firewall. Um, it's, it's also used to see who has access to databases. So when your web server, when a web server says, oh, someone's making a query of this database, I need to display them results. The RADIUS server can say, ah, oh, wait a minute, they shouldn't see those things. Um, then it can filter out. It's kind of like a traffic cop. TACX is another version of RADIUS. It's basically who can see what, who gets in, but it's a Cisco product. And uh, it's very sharp, it's fast, and it's uh, both of these products can be highly fine-tuned. Uh, the network policy server is the generic term or NPS for who gets in, how they get in, what they get uh, once they're you know connected to your network, and um, when to kick them out. So different people might have different access at different times. For accounts, we talk about user accounts a lot, but we neglect to mention that there is a big distinction between local accounts on a computer and the domain accounts. Uh, even domain member computers, whether they're workstations or member servers, will have local accounts that only access local resources. That's not a domain account. You can't get anything other than something that's on that, that computer itself. Local user accounts are held in the SAM database. SAM is a security account manager. That is a database that keeps things like the passwords and also what permissions, what group memberships an account might have, and what they have access to. Uh, servers will, most of them, if it's a server and it's a domain member, so it's part of a bigger organization, it will still have a local account. So when you're managing access to things, you have to keep in mind anyone sitting at the server that could get to a local account would still have access to all those resources. The only Microsoft servers that are part of a domain that do not have local accounts are the ones that are the domain itself, that manage the whole domain, and those are the domain controllers. Without uh, a domain controller, you don't have a domain. So the, those are uh, bigger servers and require much higher security, uh, both physical security and a lockdown policy of who can log on. Active Directory is the name of the product that's running on the domain controller. Active Directory is a database. It's a very large database with thousands of pieces of data per, per object. So this is object oriented. You're going to have a variety of objects like users plus computers. Um, groups are an object, a, a, another thing would be a printer is an object, and a room is an object because you could reserve a room and some people might have permission to do that. Uh, the uh, passwords, logins, groups, all of that information and attributes about the object uh, are all in this humongous database. And it could be like location or who's your boss or what's your phone number, those are all attributes. Um, the protocol that gets into the database and figures out who you are and whether your password is correct is a protocol called Kerberos. Kerberos makes the Windows domain 
world go round. Without Kerberos, none of this stuff works because it can't prove who you are or and what you have access to. Kerberos is actually Greek mythology for the three-headed dog. Uh, so it's it's um, supposed to be a little scary, but Kerberos is just a protocol that you have to make sure works and uh, you can tell if it's working or not if your domain's falling apart. Uh, it's only going to work inside the domain. You cannot use a Kerberos uh, protocol once you get outside your domain walls. It's, it makes no sense. It's only connected to your your Active Directory database, who has what, and for how long. It works in tickets. It grants a ticket and a ticket granting ticket. So how it for figures out that you have access, like, yes, that's your password, go ahead and log into this workstation in this classroom. It might say, you only have access for two hours. Then we're going to kick you out and you have to log in again. That's all done by this, this digital ticket system. We don't going to cover much detail about it in this class, but it is in the quiz pool, it's in the material, the Kerberos is the protocol that authenticates you, and it works with tickets. It's a ticket granting system. Uh, the central location for data in this database is also where you keep certificates. You can have a separate server create the certificates, and certificates are things that you have. So when it comes to authentication, things that you know and things that you have, the certificates are things you have. And the certificate could be the um, encryption key to your webmail, or to get to a file server, or access to um, a restricted piece of software. Now Microsoft servers have several domain services that run in the background and this this book f focuses on four of them. There are a few more that you've covered in the first half of the course such as DHCP that uh, gives out the IP addresses and DNS settings. Um, there are other services it wants to focus on such as uh, DNS itself which is fully integrated with D with Active Directory. You cannot have an Active Directory domain without DNS either on the same server or already installed on a different server. It's, it's impossible. DNS is how all the components of the domain find each other and how the services and resources find the, uh, the objects that are they're on these resources. So you've got a lot of different pieces and they all have to know where they are and how to find them. And DNS is that, that, that system that translates number to name. So if you're looking for a classroom and that classroom is a resource that's schedulable, then that has to have a name of what server to go to to find that. LDAP is fascinating and it's really essential for programmers and web developers because LDAP is a lightweight version of this database. It's a smaller, lighter version and it has some key information in it that is extremely useful for web development such as uh, a directory, a web directory of all employees or if you want information that's in Active Directory to get out and into non-Microsoft servers. For example, the Cisco servers that run phone systems are going to have Linux on the, on the backbone of it and they may need access of information such as uh, what the phone extensions are, what the name is, and who the phone should roll over to, what the directory structure is, um, what, what's the office location, things like that that are in the database. Also it helps link uh, applications so that applications are basically having hot linked information go through to the database. Uh, that's all LDAP. So it really makes a lot of connections to this useful database of, of people and information that's already there. The trick is to keep the data clean. That takes a fair amount of maintenance. The other two directory services that are talked about here are single sign-on, which is allows uh, servers to take your credentials after you've logged in and pass them through to other resources and other servers so that you don't have to do it again. Obviously, you sign on once, single sign on. Uh, Active Directory Federated Services, ADFS, you might see that when you flash by when you log in to go.waketech.edu. ADFS flashes there for a second. 
and your credentials are passed through to several other resources, including resources outside of waketech.edu. For example, Blackboard is hosted so it would pass your credit your login and password through to blackboard so if you're on the 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 portal and you click the link for blackboard it goes through you may have to click a button that says login but you don't have to actually type the password again there are lots of other resources like school dude and those other software links from the portal that gets you through not all are smooth for example linkedin learning asks you to log in and confirm a couple of times and web advisor at least for me it always asks me again what my password is um, so but but federated services helps pass through who has access to what We've talked about permissions in this class for a bit, but we really haven't talked about the distinction between rights and permissions. Rights are given to a user specifically and allow them to do actions, uh, usually having to do with um, accessing resources like backing up the files or logging on to a computer or creating users or joining a domain or some other actions that are necessary to keep a domain going, adding pieces and parts. Um, or VPNing from the outside. Now permissions have to do with objects themselves and they are more in uh, relation to their their attributes. So if there are attributes to a printer such as I can see what the default is whether it's black and white or color do I have permission to change that? Do I have permission to modify it for good or just for one-time use? Uh, do I have permission to read a file? Do I have permission to reserve a room or do I have to ask somebody else to do that for me? Permission NTFS permissions, uh, NT file system, this is an old, old term, uh, 96, 98 maybe, and NT server was the very first server I worked on in a classroom environment. Um, this was a brand new architecture, it's a new technology, that's what NT is, and it allowed more granular access to things. For example, uh, if you want someone to edit a file but not delete it, how are you going to do that? So it basically, instead of having an all or nothing access to stuff, it, it lets you break things down a bit and we're still using that architecture. So even our today, our servers today are part of the NT server system, same architecture. The NTFS has a handful of options that are pre-configured for you, but they've got uh, quirks and problems that make you want to say, oh, let's drill into this, go into the advanced settings and see if I can t adjust this a bit. And here, here are the pros and cons of these. Full control means just that. You get access to all of it. But the, the key thing that the person with full control has that the others don't is the ability to add or remove permissions. So you could remove a user that says, oh, I don't want them reading my file, and you could just take them off and just delete them or block them with a deny. And someone with full control could do that. So that's usually reserved for IT staff, uh, backup servers, and frankly, you don't want all the IT staff having that. Modify it just sounds like, oh, you're just editing documents, but with modify comes the ability to delete. So they can delete files that are being shared with others. And you want to be very careful with that. And if you're going to grant it, you might want to set, turn, set, up, uh, set up auditing and turn on auditing so you know who deleted what. And uh, read and execute, you'd be surprised how Execute, it sounds like you're running a VBS script or some sort of sneaky kind of old script, but there are a lot of scripts running inside of simple Word documents, and there are a lot of pieces and parts of an application, so it may look like you're just opening one file and more is going on. It might be feeding from a data source from somewhere else. So instead of just reading the file, they would actually need read and execute. Uh, the trick to list folder contents, now obviously you can't drill through and click through subfolders if you can't see what's inside a folder. But with list folder contents, people can gather what's going on with the files just by the file names without being able to read them. For example, I encountered something where an entire department could see 
a shared folder and in that shared folder although they did not have permission to open the files they had list folder contents and they could see file names that began with reprimand and HR related things so somebody getting a raise somebody getting reprimanded somebody who was put back on probation if the file name deals with that then they have too much information already read is very simple you can read only you can't do anything with it you can just read it write is not is a, a little more intricate than just write uh, you can add a, a file to an existing folder so you're dumping one of a file that you've created somewhere else and putting it in a folder that's with write or you can append to an existing file so if you have write permission on a folder then you can add to a file that's already there and here's an example of where that makes sense if you have a database and you are entering data you're adding records to that database so at the end of the file you're adding to the end um, you're appending and that would be only write permissions you would not need modify because then you could be deleting not only the records you could delete the whole database so you would just need write permissions to do that if you want someone to write and edit existing files but not delete, you can do it, but you have to do it with the advanced settings. You can't do it with the prefab options. We have some terms that may make more sense if I were able to draw on a, a board for you. And feel free to contact me if you need more information. Uh, inheritance and explicit, there are inherited permissions that trickle down and explicit permissions that are set right on that folder. So imagine that database we talked about where you're adding data to a database and it's in a folder that you have explicit permissions on. Now anyone who has permissions above that folder, so say it's a, a parent folder or even a folder above that, they, that person's permissions would trickle down. So if you create a new folder and a new folder inside of that, whatever permissions the parent folder had all apply to the child folders. They all keep, keep drilling in and making new stuff and all the existing permissions would still apply. Now explicit is when you set a permission directly on the folder itself. So we have that database, it's in a folder called database. We've got that dat folder inside a database and we set explicit permissions that only the IT staff are allowed to work in that database. Plus we're going to allow read, um, actually we don't even read, we need write permission for the folks entering the data. So the entering the data, adding new tickets, they would have write permission even though they're part of the IT department and they may have full you know more more important access at a above upper level folder by the time we get to this database we want to restrict things a little bit so if you looked at the folder permissions where this database is uh, the the person entering the tickets would show that they have inherited permission that's trickling down but because someone put explicit permission right on that folder and limited their access that wins so you've got an allow versus deny and then you've got more access versus less access so the IT department might have modify access to everything but the folks the help desk techs entering the tickets you're like wait just let them write that's it just write and you could set that right on the folder and that would overrule their modify permission that they got from the upper level. So it's allow versus deny but it's also one set of permissions versus another and you can do it more or less. So who wins? Whichever one is more local to the folder is going to win. So the explicit ones win but deny always beats an allow. That's a security thing. If if you're in two different groups and the IT group has allow access but the help desk group has deny access and you're in both groups, then the deny is going to win and you're not going to have access. Okay, so that's a security thing and then you have to kind of trickle down, which is why we look at uh, the complete view of who has access to something with all their group memberships because a, a user is generally not in just 
one group. They're in several groups. For more information about uh, inheritance, versus inheritance and explicit permissions, please look for Professor Messer's video on uh, CompTIA. Uh, there's one for 2.6 and I think 3.3 was another one. So I'll try to make these slides available and you can click on this link. But this is the name of the video he runs that talks about explicit versus inherited permissions. Ownership is another item altogether. Whoever creates the object, whether it's a folder or a file, it will have an owner and that owner gets to make changes to it, gets to set who has access to it, um, and there's some advanced properties. If you go in there you can see take ownership. If you have full control you can take ownership of other people's files and you can actually lock them out of their own files. What, it, what take ownership is most often used for is when employees leave or files are picked up and moved to a totally different volume. We put, put them someplace else and their ownership has to get reconnected. Um, an account can get corrupt if uh, a database, it would be a bad thing, but the Active Directory occasionally can get corrupt and if you don't have enough backups of other Active Directory domain controllers, um, the file or folder may be very confused about who its owner is and you would have to force ownership and that's called take ownership. Uh, often, the vast majority of the times it's because someone has left the organization and the supervisor says take all of those files and give them to this other person for the time being and then when someone gets hired as a, for a replacement you have to take all those files again and give them to the new person. And if they've bounced around you'd have to change the ownership so the, the new person can see them. In addition to NTFS permissions, there's a share permission. And shares are extremely important because that's how the vast majority of our access is happening. We're not actually logged on locally to the files, or maybe on our own laptops we are, but if we're in an organization and we're accessing resources, it's through a share on a server someplace. And the standard format is server name slash share name. Uh, and both the NTFS and the share permissions have to both say they allow you access for that access to happen. It's not that NTFS is more important than share or share can override NTFS. They both have to be there. If your share permission says read only but your NTFS access says modify, you're still only going to get to read only for those files. The only way you'd be able to modify them is if you were logged on to the file server itself and that and you would not be using the share to get to the files. You'd be browsing through all the folders. Then you could modify them. So both types of permissions have to be set properly for this to work. Now the administrative share is a built-in share that's automatically created when Windows is installed. And you might think it's a little bit odd that they're built in because it's a kind of it's a backdoor to access files. Uh, but this is why we have to protect the administrative administrator password. And once the administrator password is used to create other accounts, you uh, disable that administrator password. You don't want those accounts accessible in any way. Uh, the reason is that all Windows computers have a certain grouping of administrative shares that um, as long as you know that they exist, you know, you could try to get to them. The hidden share is when you take a normal folder and make a share for it, but you don't want the whole world knowing that it's there. So you could have a share called software library, but you don't want to advertise it to everybody in your house that there's a software library. So you can give it a share name and just put a dollar sign at the end of it. It's kind of like having your a hidden wireless network. You have to know what it is to type in the name to get to it. That's what a hidden share is. The administrative shares are a built-in for the C drive, the D drive, and any other hard drives that are there. There's also one for admin and print. So those are the default administrative shares built into a Windows operating system. Uh, IT staff use these all the time. Sometimes we don't even bother to put the dollar sign in back of them because we know nobody else has access to them. It's safer to make them a hidden share on the off chance that someone 
accidentally leaves a computer logged on with administrative rights um, or their help desk and IT account rights, you would be able to find this stuff. Um, but these administrator shares that are built in for C and D, uh, the network communication uses those and communicates with those. But because we know they all exist, we have to be careful of the other elements of security to keep our network safe. Another type of permission is the registry permission. So in addition to having ad, you know, access to the folder and access to the share, if I want the software to work for you as if you were the administrator on that box, I can give you the uh, bumped up permission on the registry part of that software. So registry again is another type of database. It's the brain of the operating system in terms of how the, all the apps work and who has access to what. It's got five key sections that are called hives. Um, like eight, they have nicknames in shorthand. So H key, H key local machine is um, hive key local machine and it's HKLM. Um, HKCU is current user. So who is the current user? What does Word do for the current user? That kind of thing. Um, but if I put in an uh, operating system, or sorry, if I put in an application that was a little bit different and I needed you to run that and it had some fussy permissions about where to write, I could give you administrative access for that registry key for that application. The registry has a bunch of different data types and if some of them are in binary, but the odd thing is they're the raw is binary and then they display as hex. So they can be a little bit confusing and I put in page 50 just to remind you, remind you where to go to find help with this. Let me just confirm. Yes, the registry and the classes and the roots. Okay, so there's a table on uh, 51 actually. Let me just and it will discuss the types of values and how to write how they write and how they display and what it does. But every uh, attribute to the software will have settings and those settings would be written in one of these f data types. So you could edit them, which is what editing the registry is all about. You have a D word value and you change it to another setting and it does something different when you load the software. Okay, there are several encryption types that are talked about. Uh, encryption is a whole nother set of, wow, uh, there are several classes on encryption alone and it's extremely mathematical and it can be a lot of fun. There are some tools provided by other universities to let you play with encryption. So please email me if you want me to find, to provide resources that actually let you tinker with encryption and setting encryption. So a symmetric, there are some data types, encryption types that you need to know just vocabulary wise. Symmetric just means that the same key is used to both encrypt it and decrypt it. Um, and it gives examples of those. The asymmetric ones are when it uses a, a separate key. Um, and the separate key would then, how do you get the public key versus the private key and go back and forth. Um, hash is another type of encryption and a hash encrypted is an algorithm. So it's going to use a mathematical algorithm and take different components, different elements of the file. It could be the modification date and it could be the file size. Uh, this is what would let you know if someone's tinkered with it. It would in make an algorithm of these of this information and come up with a max, uh, maximum number. What is that number? and that's the checksum. So it would compare. Is the checksum the same as it was before? That's what tell, would tell you if someone tinkered with the file. If you're, if it's hash encrypted, that's it. It's hash encrypted. So you're done with that. Um, there's a lot more to encryption and we're not going to go into great detail in this video. I'm sorry. Uh, you've got some videos in uh, the folder in Blackboard, there is a videos folder and I think the Microsoft Virtual Academy ones might have a, uh, have to get slightly rebuilt. It's going to redirect you. Um, but there is um, several videos to help out with the encryption and go check out the Professor Messer for explicit versus inherited permissions. There's a lot of text crunched into 10 pages and you'll need to review this several times. So go, go please reread that section of your text. Good luck on the quiz. Bye.